And now the time has come to start scraping the underside of the uh, cross slide. Um, I use a hard brayer here, as you can see, to apply the uh, marking compound. I also have uh, been using a soft uh, foam roller, a paint roller, and uh, used the Knode water soluble uh, paint or marking compound because then it's much more easy just to rinse with soap and water. And as always, important to wipe off with your bare hands to feel if there is any grit. Do the same on the part there and then invert the part onto the thin coat of uh, marking compound, thin so you can see through. directly down and then hinge the part feel for where it hinges and this has been scraped about six cycles in so it starts to suck down um, the part was more worn over to one side a bit hollow in the middle and then to the other side not so much need of scraping but I know that the, the top is flat to the plate then so I, it's a quite a straightforward job of, of scraping it straight down that's the important fi fact here and uh, as you can see then the, now the part is uh, starting to mark all over but there is still uh, areas where it doesn't touch and there is a, a quite deep ridge or wear track or area you can see so there's still much to do So having said that, I think uh, I've uh, I'm taking about 10 minutes to complete the cycle, meaning s s 6 per hour, and then I'll be stuck with this piece at least for a day, uh, including the dovetails and everything. Um, that is a, kind of an important fact if you're going to, let's say, make money on this uh, kind of work that you know and can say ahead how much work and then how much money it'll cost. And for those of you that uh, have seen this guy before, you know what's coming. The Biax is a very nice tool to have, not really needed as a hobbyist, but anyway. Um, it takes the pain away, as Richard says. Uh, I'm using rough uh, technique, uh, finishing uh, will come later. Circles mostly, flat blade and long uh, strokes. And I have uh, to follow my progress and, and alternate the cuts. And remember, I try to you know, describe a line here and there. And so now I'm at the sixth or seventh pass. I'll start up again. I'm taking it in careful steps here, just uh, following the um, spotted the blue areas. You could really uh, just uh, use, say, a yellow canode, then paint it all, and then just whack it until you get below the lowest area, uh, in this case where the ridge is. But the risk is that you lose control of what you're doing and, and overdo it. So. Um, I take it a little bit like in steps because I don't see the real point in stressing this. Proceeding to scrape uh, might be a point that if you have chatter and going over the in this case the right side of the edge there that you go about it from the other end. Um, then. As this is rough scraping, it doesn't really matter which technique to use, but to show then, even though it's not a really good point, you can do, of course, then crosses as here, but I would then rather do heavy crosses, which I try to, at least if my memory serves me right, show here. Try to see the difference. You can go harder down and then also uh, with a little bit less speed. But anyhow, I 
still prefer to do circles as my roughing technique. So another cycle of blowing up and listen for that thump thump hollow sound. You can hear it if, if there is a grit that is in between the plate and the part. And hinge the part again, roughly one third in from each side. So the point of rotation should be for this kind of a rectangular piece. And uh, it's also then uh, okay to in between, so you don't dig yourself uh, uh, a grave there, I mean going too far, that you measure up to uh, the original geometry again. I guess it's not so all important to get rid of all the flaws, so um, if you find out that uh, you have a very, very specific area that is lower than most other, then also then weighed against the consideration of making them uh, not making the lower the, the total too much so that you get into problems with say for instance the um, uh, knot here that you uh, have a misalignment so you need to readdress and do a lot more and just to show that this is also possible to use a hand scraper of course even though we're a cheap one of my own design with the let's say the stomach pad that Richard showed us either with a bi-x blade or a sandwich, whatever, the length as you desire. Of course, then uh, springy action is uh, desirable, as I would say. So just wail away. So just as an example here, I show this uh, lift thing out on the return stroke technique that will produce um, less burst than uh, otherwise it's a little bit harder to get the consistency needed but practice makes perfect so either that technique or a little bit speeding up or the more usual technique which will produce some burst but will also be more consistent uh, individual marks and rows I think the important thing here is also that you need to measure the depth of cut, of course, so that you know this in, with respect to how deep you, you cut when you do the machine scraping versus this, and then the amount of cycles, and then the scope of work. I mean, I have 19 cycles now, I think, and uh, this is, of course, hard work doing this hand scraping, so, but, okay. Carrying on, showing a little bit more of the hand scraping, a little bit more inconsistent uh, than, than with the machine scraping, and a lot harder. I mean, uh, you can really build up a sweat this way. Although it is uh, harder and a little bit less consistent, here also practice makes perfect, and uh, this is also then good enough, I think, for any practical use. There are different methods of holding and uh, performing this, but I like the pad against uh, the stomach and then holding with both hands to control uh, the scraping as much as I can to avoid um, scratching the part really. And also I think this is less tiresome. And this is the first scraper I had, an Anderson type with the carbide blade. Functioned okay, uh, traditional technique with a um, little bit different hand position really, but it is very likely that I, uh, when I get tired, uh, I can scratch the part because I cannot really control it in the same way. Although, cheap and easy, functions. And in addition to the Anderson scraper, we have some other types, uh, very common up here in Scandinavia, the Sandvik scraper, using the Sandvik blades. And then of course, uh, I, uh, as a Bi-X man, I had to have a Bi-X hand scraper. So this uses, um, of course, you can use the Sandvik blades, but most often then, and meant for to use the longer um, or shorter shank uh, bi-x blades. But common to all of these 
are that they are a bit on the stiff side. Even the Andersons will be a bit stiff. As you can see in comparison with my homemade type, much more springy and flexible, which is better. So out of the collection I have here shown, uh, I think, uh, of course, the far cheapest is my homemade version, and I think the best also. But uh, most important is to have the, at least some kind of springy action, and uh, the bike blade is, of course, not cheap. Alternatively, if you make yourself a uh, springy long shank holder for the sandwich blade, this is okay, as long as you keep in mind that you have to grind it to the correct geometry. Marking compound, alternatives to the water soluble, which is better from a cleaning perspective, a canode. You have the diamond, or the diamond here, and then also alternatively something called an oil based water soluble uh, marking compound from Ariston. I'm not sure about exactly how the chemistry functions, but it has leaked anyway, so it's a mess already. And the stone you need to, for deburring can be either, for instance, a diamond uh, one or the usual triangular shape, which gets into the corners there. Uh, stone I get uh, from uh, the US. Um, not probably considered uh, too much, but I learned important is the fact that it has to be really flat. So uh, this is okay, and uh, actually the, the diamond is also okay. But this is important, of course. And then concerning uh, the different scraping blades needed, we have the collection from um, Biax here, where you have the different types, long shank or short shank, and different uh, holders for different purposes. Uh, all those, I would say for us amateurs, uh, use the long shanked versions. I know that the other ones are much more commonly available, but these will give you much more springy and uh, good action. I think we can consider these shorter ones, the stubby blades, for experts only. They will fight you a lot more. So leave that for the pros. It's also okay to learn pull scraping, aside push scraping. Good for pockets, for instance, where you can't so easily get into. Uh, resting uh, the shank to your shoulder and pulling the blade, like uh, shown here, produces no burrs, and it can give you an extremely nice surface. I mean, finishing techniques like the Swiss do on their machines. That's an okay technique to learn also. So, progressing a little bit, um, not really finished with the uh, rough scraping, still some areas left, but we are nearing the finish stages of the rough scraping. And um, you can say that uh, moving to finish scraping, that means that we, instead of trying to um, align the piece, we have done that and then cons uh, consider, or uh, let's say, focus on getting up the points per inch, which uh, we do by cutting the, each support point into, um, into more points. And then over, a, uh, let's say, a square inch here, which I try to, to draw, I have then support points. So in this case, 16, but normally it would be 10 to 20 is okay for this kind of piece. And they should be also then um, between 40 and 60 percent um, of the area, so that if we draw up this in equal uh, frames, the point should be as big as the hollow oil spots uh, or hollow cavities. This means that we have a percentage of point, in this case it's 50 then. And um, when we have a, a scraped surface after we have uh, done this. Uh, we will see then that there is much blue left because we are not trying to, to kill all the blue spots. We are trying to cut them in, in two or in more. So that uh, really represents a, a change from the rough scraping. Uh, 
now satisfied with the alignment of the piece. It's within um, one hundredth of a millimeter all over corners, and then with um, at least to some degree of finishing. Uh, not finished yet, but at least at this stage, um, I wanted to just take a, a pause and then show you. Um, I've been lucky, of course, then to have uh, Richard King as my mentor, so that uh, we as students have been taught something that is, uh, let's say, best practice, or at least one of the practices that they do in professional uh, rebuilding of machinery. Uh, of course, this is a trade. I mean, uh, something that you move from being an apprentice to a, to a master, and then I can't watch for for anyone but myself, but I've learned a lot during the course of these 10-15 uh, years I've been doing this, so um, a little bit like a trained um, uh, amateur, I can call myself. But it takes a long time to learn and to master, and uh, still new things uh, to consider each, uh, each time, and I learn every day, really. Um, you have to uh, learn to scrape, to push scrape, to pull scrape. You learn all these other different techniques, and different tools. And uh, I would say that it's not needed, for instance, to have a, a biax, even though sought after. But a, a good hand scraper is is a must. And then also then just take your time and uh, and as I said, practice makes perfect. One of the things that um, that we then uh, uh, would want to emphasize also is the depth of cut. And this is important because this uh, really uh, uh, defines uh, the longevity of your work. I mean, how long uh, can the machine last? And the more points and with a sufficient depth of cut, the better. So uh, each uh, cut then will be defined as individual marks on individual rows. That's uh, one of the key things here. Then uh, with high points then, beside where you scrape, so you have oil pockets of sufficient depth. Say they are uh, uh, five to one hundredth of a millimeter, I mean five thousandths to one hundredths. Then you have a, a pattern like this where you have um, oil pockets in the valleys, and then you have support points on top. And of course, uh, over the course of time, uh, uh, on the use, the piece will wear, so it's important to have sufficient depth. And, um, and I would also say it's nice to know uh, the precise uh, depth that you do cut, because then, let's say for my example where I said it's 10 minutes per cycle, if my depth of cut here as shown with these blocks are between half a hundred and a hundredth of a millimeter, then I can say that, okay, in one hour I'll cut this depth, and that uh, if I then know the wear of the machine, I can say that, okay, I think I'll finish the piece in say eight hours, and based on that, if I if I charge money for my work, then this will be a calculation that is, of course, uh, something that the pros really need to do or need to know. So the depth of cut is important not only for for machine precision alignment purposes, and um, but also for the scope of work, so to speak. So um, keep that in mind. Depth of cut is important.